Welcome to Module 8, where we'll be focusing today on promoting a positive culture, conflict resolution, and looking at the complex change model. My name is Chris Sadler. I'm the Director of Human Resources for the Sun Prairie Area School District. Uh, just a little background on me as I grew up in Heartland, Wisconsin. I started education career, my education career uh, teaching kindergarten for 10 years. Um, graduated from UW-Madison in 1998 when I moved down to Atlanta. Uh, worked for six years in a kindergarten um, teaching role with um, in a large, large school district, one of the largest in the country, the Gwinnett County public school system um, outside of Atlanta. Um, I was one of 17 kindergarten teachers on the grade level. Um, lots of learning over those six years, obviously with that many teachers that I could learn from and work with. Um, after teaching in Atlanta, I moved back up to Wisconsin, um, to central Wisconsin in the Wisconsin Rapids area. Uh, I was a kindergarten or a 4K teacher in the Adams Friendship uh, School District for a year, and then I taught in Nakusa as kindergarten teacher, and I was lucky enough to then become principal in Nakusa at Humkey Elementary um, there for a few years, and then I moved to uh, Marshall, Wisconsin, and um, personally moved to Sun Prairie with my family, but uh, was principal at the Marshall Early Learning Center for five years. Um, after that, I was lucky enough to become principal of C.H. Bird in Sun Prairie in the community I live in. And then uh, in 2018, I began my career here as a director of human resources uh, for the last two years in the growing district of Sun Prairie. The first thing we want to talk about is first, uh, what's the difference between climate and culture? Um, there are a lot of different ways to look at this. Sometimes these are used interchangeably. Um, and actually, it's really important to define both. Um, because when you have staff members you're working with, sometimes they'll talk about climate and culture, and really they're talking about the other one. Um, if you want to, you can take a look at an article that's in our resources, which uh, goes in a little more depth than the climate versus culture. But basically, when you're looking at a culture, um, you're looking at the unspoken beliefs, things that sometimes on the outside, you a person may not really know um, the personality of an organization, how things are done. Some of those things that are done, you can see. Um, this may take a long time to evolve and it's constantly evolving bit by bit. Uh, but it's one of those things that's harder to put your finger on uh, because it's just the way things are done. Um, and sometimes what that means is that it's difficult to change because there are people that come into the organization that start doing what has been done and they don't even know why. Um, so sometimes it's a lot harder to change because people don't really know the why behind some of the things they do. They just do them and then stick to them. Unwritten rules uh, are more about climate and it's like how things feel in the building. And this can actually change from day to day and week to week. Um, it's the spirit of an organization, the attitude of the organization. Um, a lot of the times you'll hear the statement of I can just feel this when I come into the building. That can be positive or negative. Um, I wouldn't say it's it's easier to change than culture. Um, and it, you'll hear a lot about the talk of fit, especially when you're hiring people as people just say, oh, this person just fits or this person doesn't fit. And that can be a good thing and that can be a bad thing when you're hiring uh, because uh, sometimes you actually wanna bring somebody in that doesn't exactly fit per se. Um, they may fit the overall culture and climate of the building, but you want somebody that maybe calls those out a little bit too to help it grow and progress instead of staying where it is. So what I want you to do is I want you to think about two questions that come to mind and that is uh, climate. Always the question is how does the school feel? And the culture is how does the school do things? And just take a look at this short video and it'll kind of help you think through those questions more as you think about yourself as a school leader. So you've been reading in Culture Eyes um, about uh, eradicating average. You know, what, what does that actually look like in your new role? So I want you to think forward um, as you step into a certification area, um, if you go into superintendent, business services, principal, whatever it might be, and you walk into a situation where you feel like uh, people are okay with average. You know, how do you go about eradicating that or getting to a point where people have higher expectations of themselves in the organization? Um, you know, as Todd Whitaker kind of talks about in the in the quote up top, is your culture of your organization will be defined by the worst behavior you're willing to tolerate. 
which is the same concept of you know allowing average to um, continue. Um, how do you how do you eradicate that and get people to understand that average um, actually is what people will look at your organization as being um, if you allow it to continue? The other part of this slide is there is an opening day presentation um, that you might be interested in in watching. It's forty minutes long, so it's kind of long, but. Um, Take a look at it if you want. Um, I know a lot of people don't have spare time in the work that you're doing, but um, it is a good video to just kind of keep on hand and, and think through as you get through it. So again, kind of we're going to talk more about the culture of schools now and focus on that. Um, the culture of schools really is the patterns and beliefs and assumptions and effects they share about the school and their place in it. Um, it's the patterns, the practices, uh, the values and artifacts that all uh, stakeholders um, understand who they are and how they are to function within that culture. And sometimes they aren't even written down. Um, it just kind of happens and, and people enculturate new people into the organization without even really knowing why they're doing what they're doing. So again, uh, you know, it's a culture is really a set of values and assumptions that underlie the statement of this is how we do things around here. And a lot of times you can probably picture yourself either on a team or even hearing your teachers or staff say that to a new person. You know, the person might say, well, why, why do we do that uh, structure or why, why do we do it that way? And uh, the answer is, uh, this is just how we do things around here. And that actually can be a really good thing or a really tough thing on the organization. And what I mean by being a really good thing is that uh, if, if something is just equity is just how we do things around here. Um, that can be a really good statement and just saying this is this is our expectations very high. Um, every student every day is going to get our best. That's a great statement around this is just how we do things around here and can be a really great rallying cry when staff see another staff member not holding to that. But then there's the opposite of that is when uh, something is really hindering an organization from moving forward and somebody says, hey, don't push that. This is just how we do things around here. And that can really hinder the organization, either pushing people out with new ideas and them saying, I can't be a part of this if they're not gonna listen to my ideas. Or it can really um, kind of smush the idea of uh, innovation uh, because innovation might be seen as a threat and it could go against how the idea of this is how we do things around here. So you can really, that statement can be both really both ways. So again, when we look at culture, it's the norms, the values, the beliefs, the traditions, rituals, ceremonies, and even myths upheld by the faculty. And myths are the pieces where um, people are saying, this is how we do things around here. And it's for actually the detriment to the, to the organization rather than the, uh, the affirmative for the organization. So I want to talk about three levels of culture uh, put together by a person named Shine in 1996. Uh, it's a long time ago, but actually these are really interesting pieces to look at and might give you a different view of what culture actually is and how you can go about changing it. Um, so there's something called the artifacts level, the value and beliefs level, and then the underlying assumptions level, which we'll talk about here. So the artifacts level, these are things that are almost tangible or observable. Um, they're the rituals, the ceremonies, the icons, the things that are very simple to see uh, by anybody's standard. It could be within staff or somebody just walking into a building or a district. These are things like, obviously, the art artifacts are what the students provide, how you do roll call in class, how the bell for the first period and when that happens and, and what happens after that. When do announcements happen? What happens on announcements? Um, you know, the, the long hallway in the main building, which means it could have trophies in it, it could have pictures of past classes in it, it could have um, different things that people hold the organization high about. And, and it could be things that happened 50 years ago. And um, those things people can see and touch and hear um, and see how the culture of that building is wrapped up into those pieces. And sometimes it's pretty amazing, an icon uh, or the organization like a principal from 20 years ago, it still might have tangible ways of seeing uh, or being able to see how that culture is created. Um, again, through how announcements are done, uh, different school assemblies, 
Um, sometimes school assemblies are created and nobody really even knows why they do them anymore. They just know that they do them every year. Values are the pieces that um, sometimes are really hard to put your finger on because uh, they show up in so many different ways. Uh, but these are internalized um, and they could be right or wrong, ethical and ethical or moral and moral, like it says. Because um, like I said, a lot of the times of when it comes down to this is just how we do things here, um, it could be right and wrong. And, and that changes because it depends on how we look at education. But this can be focused on fairness you know, what's fair and what's equal um, around patriotism, you know, uh, do we do the Pledge of Allegiance? Uh, what do we allow during that uh, is a question that comes up a lot, but there's many other ways to do that as well. Um, how does justice and equity play into your values? Um, how does it show up in your data? Sometimes that data is really hidden and you can't see it always, but it is telling a story of your culture. Um, and again, that could be right or wrong um, or moral, immoral, whatever it might be. Um, but it shows up in data. It's just sometimes you don't understand where that data is coming from. You have a feeling, but you can't put your finger on it. How do you look at progress? Does your organization value um, thoughtful innovation or does it want to stay where it is? Uh, where is honesty in your organization? I'll go back to data on this. If the data is telling you something, do you make excuses about the data? Or do you look at it and say, we got to make strategies to make that better, or we have to make strategies to continue that if it's a good uh, outcome for students? Self-fulfillment, um, what I mean by that, or what it means by that is uh, basically it is what you believe is what you become. Um, you know, and, and it, within an organization that can change a lot. If a leader can come in and really focus on the idea of what do we actually want to become in our vision, that organization can change what it values actually pretty quickly. Whereas culture sometimes doesn't change, but if that vision is strong and people understand the why, that's where self-fulfillment comes into play. And then finally, uh, what is your value around cooperation? Is there a, a, an attitude of competition between departments or schools in your district? Or is there values of cooperation and helping one another to meet high goals? Um, and that, again, is focused on your strategic planning. Um, even though strategic planning is something that is, I would say, is more of a, a climate because you can really see it. But the culture is, is how do you stick to that strategic planning? There's a high importance on values. Uh, values can influence a leader's preferences and aspirations, perceptions of situations and problems, and how to actually react to a certain situation. And that leader, um, you know, people can really, uh, they watch you and they want to see how you react and how you react can really set the tone for a climate on how they react, but also on a culture if it really sticks and, and people understand the why of what you're doing as a leader, um, they will start believing in that and it will become more of an in-depth, uh, deep-seated culture um, than it is more of a climate on a day-to-day -day basis. And that, again, could be good or bad, depending on how you react. If you react in a way that's um, reasonable and thoughtful and you really explain the why, uh, that can become a culture in the positive aspect. Um, if they see you as um, up and down, not really knowing what the next step is, um, and actually being somewhat unsure and actually creating almost an idea of um, people not feeling safe because they're not really sure how you're going to react to the next situation, um, that can create a culture of unease, of anxiousness, um, and a feeling of, I have to take care of myself before I have to worry about everybody else. And that can create a culture that is very toxic. Um, in, in essence, uh, a lot of the times uh, the importance of values can uh, matter and see how, how people see the world and everyone sees it a little differently. And a leader has to understand that and see that perspectives are different going into every situation. Is, is how do you react to that different perspective? Not in a way that means that you acquiesce to those different um, perspectives is just understanding how do you take those into account so you can get a pulse for the whole organization and make decisions that help the organization move forward, but also honor the different people that are in there.
Now, when we're looking at the technical facts of values, uh, sometimes values uh, are really tied into a vision. And when what it means by the technical facts are not as available or as important, that doesn't mean that um, you know you throw them to the side. But sometimes people will look at the facts and say, okay, that's where we're at. And that's important to know, but it's not important to our vision. All that's going to do is help us understand where we are in moving our vision. So you just have to continue to connect back with the facts and the data, but understand that you don't want that to tell the story, even though it might be now. How do you create um, a culture where those facts change in the positive so it can tell your story in a different way and help you connect with that vision later? So the underlying assumptions value, a lot of the time these values um, aren't recognizable. You can't just walk into a building and understand why people are doing the, the things that they're doing. You might think um, that you know, but you don't know all the why behind it. So when you're first starting as a leader, it's very, very hard to recognize that right away. Uh, you might walk into that um, for the first three months and it's kind of that honeymoon period and you assume that that's the way the culture is, but you start seeing bits and pieces that show that maybe the culture is different than what you're walking into from a climate perspective. Um, and you have to start digging into those as quick as possible. The one thing that I always recommend um, along this line is that uh, many of the times when we have uh, those underlying assumptions is you have to meet with people face to face and kind of get a feeling for, you know, what they're what they want to see as a change when you first step in. And sometimes what they want as a change might not be best, but if you start hearing a theme of what they want changed, it's telling you a little bit of a picture of what people are frustrated by um, and want to see better. And that might help you understand what is actually happening in the culture um, as you meet with people and listen to the, what they have to say. Now, again, you don't want to all go on the negative, but you want to also understand the positives of what people feel like within that culture too. You know, what is going well and why do you think that's going well? Um, we'll tell you just as much of a picture of asking the question as what isn't going well and why do you think that is and what do you want to see a change of? So the challenge for a leader, as each of you uh, will step into different positions, is that it's to understand the environment and how to respond to it. Uh, because again, we're looking to reduce anxiety, which really all you're trying to do is create a sense of safety. So people feel safe with you and also people feel safe with moving forward and, and giving ideas. Um, you want to get away from that confusion and uncertainty that they might have, especially as a new leader comes in, because they look at that as a they might look at it as a, as a huge opportunity to change whatever they want to change within the culture and climate of the school or district, but they also look at it as a threat because they're going to look at you and think, are they going to change the things I'm comfortable with? And sometimes that can be good and sometimes that can be bad again is the idea that sometimes you might want to change what they're comfortable with and sometimes you'll see something as like, wow, that's a really good thing that they're comfortable with that, so we want to keep that going. Either way, they might look at you as a threat, as changing that. Um, so just be thoughtful about that as you step in and create that sense of safety so you can show people that you're listening, but you're also not going to be okay with average and you're not going to be okay with data that shows that we're not meeting the needs of all kids. So the next step is really, how do you build consensus around values um, that show you know, a commitment to that non-average um, or the idea that you're going to be a thoughtful uh, risk taker and looking for innovation that all students will learn with that assumption underneath it uh, to really show people that that's what you believe and that's what you want the culture to be at the school or district that you step into. So let's look at climate really quickly. Uh, culture is the one thing that I find is probably the one that you want to put your most effort into because it does eventually obviously change the climate. But the climate is how people perceive the quality of the environment or, or the work unit that they're in. It's taking a look at the whole thing. How are students doing? How are staff doing? What am I hearing from my colleagues? Uh, good, bad, or ugly? And they take that into account and they define the climate as that. Uh, the climate of school may be warm or pleasant, or it could be hostile and unpleasant, um, or anywhere in between. Um, and then the climate of the school does reflect the culture of the school. 
it doesn't mean that it uh, clearly defines the culture, but you can see the underlying uh, pieces that are, again, strong in the culture or, or need areas of growth. And you can see that in how people react on a day-to-day -day basis. The one thing that I always think about climate is this is where people get very uh, kind of confused about the two, is they will say like, oh, our culture and our school is great. Um, but really what they're talking about is the climate because it can change from day to day, week to week, and month to month. Um, you know, depending on how things are going on the outside of education, that can really affect the climate. And then people will deem that as the culture. And it, it's kind of like that reminder of, well, you know, I remember a couple of months ago, we were like really doing well and people were really happy with where we're at. But right now we're, we're struggling on a day to day basis. It doesn't mean that we've changed as an organization. It just means that there might be an outside pressure that's changing how we look at our work each day. And, you know, examples of that could be uh, when Act 10 was passed back in 2010, that obviously changed a lot of culture the way it, or the climate the way it was, because it felt like it was changing the culture. And maybe it was a little, but it really was pushing on the climate of the day to day work in a school. Um, other pieces of that could be the time of year. Um, you know, for those of you in elementary, but probably see in other levels too, is around winter break time. Uh, climate can be a, can be struggling because the kids are struggling uh, with the distractions and changing routines, uh, and the staff is struggling because the students are you know uh, struggling at school, and then they um, start making the comments of like, "Wow, our culture in our school is really struggling right now," when really it's just a reminder of it. It's 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 climate. We can do, we can change that actually really quickly with how we react to different things uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, which that's the difference between climate and culture is if you can um, help people understand that this can change, climate can change based on how you react, that means it's a climate. Uh, but eventually it does affect culture if it continues and people have a negative attitude on a day-to-day -day basis about what's going on and feeling like that affects their work because it can start changing their routines which then ends up changing culture. One thing you can look at just to kind of get an understanding of how one district really put a step-by-step -step process, step -step process in under, helping staff understand what the culture of that district really is about and what they do, what they feel, how they do things on a day-to-day -day basis, but eventually really how that district wants to do things connected to their vision. So Merrill, um, area of public schools has a culture playbook. Just check that out and you'll see how quickly um, that district is defined specific pieces in their district about what they believe and how that should play out in their day-to-day -day work. Um, it's a nice simple idea of how a district went about the idea of defining culture for that school. Um, so staff understand what they're stepping into when they're new or what they should be upholding as they stay in the organization. So I want you to take a look at a, a research article from the UW about uh, just the, the struggle of having uh, quality teachers and quality staff in schools um, right now and, and moving into the future about the, the lack of people coming into education. And it's really interesting because as we know that districts are competing over, um, over scarce resources of uh, quality uh, educators coming out of uh, college as we as we uh, change our, our over our organization with new hires, um, it really is important to think about the culture of schools because as things um, get tighter and competitive for people to come into your organization that you hope fit your culture or, or fit the vision of your culture, um, what you really wanna think about is how does your culture um, align with your core values and how does somebody um, coming in uh, to your school district how do you attract them knowing that culture and climate are so important? What does this mean for the certification area, for your superintendents, uh, for your principals, for your directors of uh, instruction, special ed, business services? What does this mean? Um, how do you create a culture and climate that is so strong it actually attracts you know, some of our um, especially hard to fill certification areas? And then for school business administrators, this is an interesting article even though it really talks about um, the difficulty and challenge of uh, providing uh, quality educators in your system, 
it really comes down to the finances. What does this mean about creating um, structures, both from a benefit standpoint, a compensation standpoint, but also helping um, the directors and superintendents and principals attract those people into your organization? So the next step when you're looking at culture is really thinking about how do you restructure schools? Um, how do you create a change in climate? How do you create a change in culture? Putting a focus on interpersonal relationships between your staff and yourself and the community. Those three things together obviously are the, the biggest pieces in creating a, a system where um, staff feel safe, staff want to stay and come to, and most importantly, students love coming to school every day and their outcomes are strong across the board. Um, now, when you're changing climate, remember that is a day-to-day -day, and as a leader, that is something that isn't always easy, but it is a simple way of looking at your day-to-day -day process. How do you make just little changes to make people a little bit happier to come to work every day? That's something that's very simple to come into. That doesn't mean you acquiesce and make people happy um, for the sake of making people happy, but you look at it, you listen to your staff in those first 90 days and understand, hmm, what are those things that I can easily change right now to show that I'm listening? And that changes climate very quickly. Now that does not mean it's going to change culture long term, but those little wins help you challenge culture to improve it because they see you as listening and they think, okay, so this person now is listening to me. They have changed little things to make it better. I trust them when they might question something that is a long-standing tradition that might not be in the best interest of kids. And then obviously that does connect with your interpersonal relationships as a leader, is as you listen and make little changes to help the climate, they see you as somebody to trust and you start creating those relationships that you can use to again challenge culture in the long run. To break up the monotony a little bit of a uh, slideshow like this one, uh, I want to look. I want you to look at two videos. Uh, one of them is a superintendent just tying into talking about um, creating hope in schools, and then just a, a kind of an interesting video. You've probably seen a million of them, but uh, this bus driver is just recognized for making. Uh, basically the first start of every day for students a positive one and you know it, what I see in the bus driver is the idea that uh, every employee uh, has their has the ability to create such a positive start for students and um, if this bus driver is the epitome of how the school district he works for if that's their culture just think about how amazing that day would be for that student if that's how they started every day and ended every day um, just a really interesting video. So I want you to think through like as a school leader in whatever role you're looking for, um, how do these videos, videos match with your own core values? Um, how do you video, how do these videos connect with your current school environment? And what's the power of these videos? How does this help you as a leader? Just quickly think through the importance of culture. So going from that video to this, uh, the focus is on now resolving conflict and conflict management, because no matter how great your culture is, how great your climate is, there's going to be conflict. Um, and sometimes that conflict can really help your district or school grow. Other times um, it can actually uh, be very detrimental to the growth and actually stifle uh, any innovation or growth that you might want to see happen in the future. So what is conflict? I like this definition, uh, very simple, the interaction of um, interdependent people, so people that work with each other, uh, but they sometimes uh, look at goals and aims and views and disagree, and that can cause uh, some conflict um, as they look at uh, realizing whatever goals are part of an organization or school. So. There's obviously some conflict that occurs in schools between an, or within an individual, and that's the in the internal conflict that a person might be in an organization and it doesn't fit their own values and, and core beliefs, or a decision doesn't fit it. So there's conflict, and people have to work with that in, within themselves because there is no way that um, you're a part of an organization and at some point 
you don't have a conflict within yourself with what is happening and you don't you don't agree with it and you have to come to terms with that and work through that um, there's conflict that happened between individuals among faculty members um, between groups within the larger faculty which means like within departments within like custodians and teachers uh, leadership and teachers uh, leadership and central administration a lot of the times you know depending on which organization or which employee group you're part of um, there's a we versus they mentality and you really want to get away from that you want to focus on the what do we do together to make this better but there are times where even district administration and building administration has a there might be a we they conversation well district office said this and this is i guess what we have to do now and that concept is like a they um, whereas a we is we've made this decision together we feel like this is best for our organization and this is how we're moving forward it sends a very different message to the people receiving that message So conflict can be functional or dysfunctional. A lot of the times conflict obviously has a negative connotation to it because you think of arguing. Um, and arguing actually can be good or bad. It depends on the, the, the subject because if you're looking at improving your organization, there's going to be conflict. And that's actually a good thing because it makes people more thoughtful. They hear another perspective. Now they can also turn dysfunctional if the... Um, the concept is not looked at as a growth opportunity, but it looks as a competitive opportunity where one person is trying to quote unquote get their way um, or somebody that truly does not believe in the, the direction of the organization or school. Functional conflict. When it's functional, the school or district actually benefits. Um, there's almost a concept of yes, I know I want this or I feel like this direction is best. I feel like this direction is best. That conflict kind of comes together and there's almost a compromise of both making the actual um, decision or direction much stronger because it's taking two ideas and molding them into one that everybody agrees upon and it almost creates like a harmony uh, moving forward even though there still might be uh, an acknowledgement of I still don't know if I agree with that but I understand where they're coming from and I believe that if we take this direction together we will come out stronger. Functional conflict is when you know the dysfunction is kind of a win-lose attitude like while well, they won my idea was never taken into account and they're just going in their direction and there's this almost this uh, underlying hostility towards it and sometimes even outwardly <laughs> hostile towards it um, but people don't see it as working together they think that it is a we they well they made the decision they think they know what's right they think I'm wrong even though I think I am and I am going to do everything in my power to not do exactly what they say or I'm going to kind of um, fly under the radar and slowly um, deteriorate against whatever decision they made um, and undermine it. That can cause problems across the system that are both very recognizable and very difficult to recognize, which can cause um, definitely, you know, long-term growth not to happen because it's constantly people fighting with one another, both in very outward and inward ways um, that is not healthy. So we talked a little bit about types of conflict. Uh, sometimes there's a conflict that happens within a group, a uh, conflict that happens um, between two groups in an organization. Again, it could be building administration and district administration or administration and teachers, administration and staff, support staff and teachers. You know, there's so many that happen. Um, some big ones where, you know, like again, uh, administration and teachers, if administration makes a decision that doesn't define the why, um, a teacher group doesn't understand the why and doesn't agree with the decision itself because they don't understand all the, the pieces behind it, it cause a lot of problems between the groups. Um, there's also conflict that happens, and I know I've been a part of this, like when I was a teacher, um, uh, there was custodians that didn't feel like the teachers were respecting their work and they weren't cleaning up the way they needed to before they left and then the custodians couldn't get their work done. So, you know, there's like that type of conflict too. Uh, Interorganizational could be between two organizations. It could be within a district, like two schools. Um, there could be conflict between them uh, based on community, demographics, whatever it might be. Um, 
or there might be a community organization that's trying to support families and they're in competition with schools and one believes the other one is not doing it the right way and they're not cooperating with each other to actually go towards a common goal. And then there's conflict within role. Uh, and what that means is that um, if I'm a teacher and my neighbor is a teacher, my role is, I feel like my role is to do one thing. Another person thinks that their role is to do another. And there's a constant conflict between roles. Um, they might not even recognize it. Uh, but what it does is cause inconsistency, almost a feeling of um, unsafeness, uh, especially for students. Let's say, you know, one teacher has an expectations of behavior in one way and another has another grade level teacher, say a second grade teacher believes in certain expectations behaviorally. They go to the music room and those expectations are different for that half hour. It can cause a lot of conflict within kids, uh, which then causes conflict within staff as well. So there's three main causes for conflict, typically. Uh, competition for resources, um, a desire to kind of do things on your own, um, and then how goals connect with one another, and if they connect or not, or one believes in the goals in a different way. So conflict management is a process of resolving and minimizing the disagreements resulting from perceived or real differences. Conflict management, the one thing that I, I always caution especially new administrators on conflict management is not making everybody happy um, you will find very quickly that uh, it is impossible to make everybody happy all the time conflict management is really focusing on your goals your values of your organization focusing on the vision and mission of your district and really making sure your decisions are constantly connected to that it will cause conflict that does not mean that everybody's going to be happy all the time. And actually, it's a good thing that people aren't happy all the time. And what I mean by that is if you're pushing in the right ways, people will have some level of discourse. And that discourse could look like conflict, and that's not a bad thing. So just know that conflict management does not mean that you're managing to try to make everybody happy. All you're trying to do is manage the conflict in a way that makes it functional and always focused on growth. So again, there's a lot of strategies for managing conflict. There's avoiding it, there's smoothing it, and smoothing really does mean trying to make everybody happy. Bargaining, uh, bargaining is more about compromise um, and giving one thing to give up another. Um, power struggle, that's just back and forth. I would say that that's more about um, arguing in a way that's dysfunctional, that nobody's really listening to each other. They're just trying to make their point and, and move on. Uh, and then there's problem solving, which you actually sit down with the people, the person, um, the organization that, that you're having conflict with and coming up with a way that solves, um, the issue does not mean everyone agrees with everything that happens. But what it does is it connects people back with the vision and mission of your district in order to set goals that make sense and you can uh, move on from the conflict and focus on growth. So again, avoidance is uh, they want to maintain the climate and avoid hostility. It doesn't resolve the conflict, just makes people not deal with it. Smoothing, trying to make people happy um, and minimize differences in opinion, which again, it's hard to diff, you can minimize conflict, but I don't think you can minimize differences of opinion because we actually want some difference in opinions. Um, you know, I always think about the, the lemming game. Um, I don't know if some of you played this, but back before all the cool video games now, uh, the lemming game was you tried to stop lemmings from falling over the cliff in this game. You tried to put barriers because they were all following whoever the leader was. Um, and what I think about with that is somebody can have um, an idea as a leader and it might be the worst idea ever and it won't help kids grow. And if everyone just kind of follows with it because they feel like they should uh, to, you know, make people happy, um, everybody falls over the cliff. So um, instead of trying to make people happy and just follow because you should or minimize conflict, um, you have to be really careful with that because you do want somebody to step up once in a while and say, I don't think that's a good idea because of these reasons. 
uh, bargaining, um, this is where uh, you basically it's what it says is that you uh, give up to um, get in a way. Um, nobody really wins or loses completely. There still might be a sense though of um, underlying hostility because it's like, well, I gave up more than I uh, really got in that deal. And there's this concept of still not understanding the why, but there's almost um, a give and take um, that sometimes people will see as fair or unfair. But it's also sometimes needed in bargaining to get to a bigger goal. It, it, it's very difficult to um, sometimes get to a bigger goal without some of that happening. Uh, power struggle. This is where uh, it truly is like a dysfunctional um, argument. Um, and it's more about checking things off the list, but not really thinking about um, what's the long-term ramifications of this being quote unquote solved through um, using power and force to kind of break down uh, what the other person is saying, uh, no matter what the consequences might be out of that or the collateral damage people might say. Um, as far as problem solving, this is where it's a little more collaborative. Uh, you manage that conflict in a way that uh, your main goal is that the culture and climate are maintained at a positive level, but the vision and mission are always shown in every decision that's made as you work through the solving of whatever conflict that is. Um, problem solving may look a, a little bit about like bargaining, and there might be pieces of that in there. But really, problem solving is bringing everybody to the table. What's everybody's perspective? What's everybody's intention? And what's everybody's focus on the vision and mission? Do we still understand why we're doing what we're doing? And then listening to those ideas, bringing them together to understand what are the best next steps so everybody can jump on that bandwagon of why and really push forward to whatever the goal is that's causing the conflict. So it's inevitable, right? Um, it's in every organization, every school. Um, effective leaders really look um, and consider the nature of the conflict, its intensity, the people involved, and the seriousness of the issues. One thing that I think is important uh, among others is that what is the intensity and seriousness of the issues? There are many times as a school leader or leader in any organization that when you hear um, the 5% of people that are pushing against some decision or some direction or something that's happening, you have to recognize, is this just 5% or is this a majority of people that are really struggling with this? Because what you're going to hear is the negative 5% are very loud. And there are times when it feels like, is this how everybody's feeling? And you start making that decision based on the 5%. You have to be careful of, your, of doing that. So when you start hearing that conflict arise, do some one internal searches in yourself as a leader, but also do some external searches and talk with different people. Some of the trusted colleagues you have, how are you feeling about this? And you might find out that a majority of people are not having conflict with it. It's a small minority. And then you have to make the decision of, do I address this? Or is just this something that people are going, those 5%, it is what it is. Now, I don't like that attitude typically. I like addressing it, but it's better to go into the idea of how many people are actually feeling this way and how intense really is it. Um, and then looking at the nature of the conflict is, again, where does this actually come from? All right, so how do you manage complex change? Um, obviously, it's easier said than done. Uh, but when you look at uh, the components of it, I believe uh, this slide and the next slide around this chart of managing complex change, for me, made it very a much more simple concept. It's not easy. It's just simpler of looking at it. So when you think about complex change and when you're thinking about changing, especially culture, that is highly complex um, because it is so steeped in history and the people that are there and just that that same concept of this is just how we do things around here. 
And that can be good and bad, like we've talked about, is that there are things in culture that can be really good historically and where people are now and the beliefs that underlie those. Um, but there's some things that can really be a detriment to the long-term growth of an organization, and you have to tackle those. And they can be really complex. So some things to think about. Uh, questions as you go through it. What is the vision? What is the goal that you are trying to attain? What are the skills that people need to attain that goal? And that includes yourself as a leader. What will engage employees to drive them to meet the goal? A lot of the times we do think about financial pieces and there are, I mean, there are pieces in there, but what we find over and over, especially with people in education, it is really about how people feel about their connection to the organization and how they feel how they fit within that culture. If they feel a deep connection to the vision, the mission, and all the strategies being used to meet those, they will be highly engaged more than anything that money could do for them. Um, so it's really important to think through that question of what is going to be the most effective in really motivating people to meet the goal. What are the resources we need? Professional development. Where do we need to put our finances? Where does that fit to change this culture? You have to have a strategic budgeting for this. Now, when we were talking about incentives, that is one thing that you can look at with um, for finances to help people feel uh, motivated. However, when we're talking about resources in this point is where are the resources currently going? Are those resources actually showing that they're connected to our vision and mission? Or is that just something that is connected to something historical that we've just always put money there um, or we've always spent money there? But is it effective? That is a big question that people have to ask as you're moving forward. And then finally, the action plan. What are the steps that go there? Who's responsible for them? How do we know you're going in the right direction? What's the timeline of, of getting to whatever change you're looking for? And sometimes the change in culture it's long term. When we think about a three year process, yes, you can do a lot of things in three years. But typically, when we're looking at culture, most uh, research will say it could take anywhere from three to seven years and maybe longer. But basically, within that range is where it can fit because culture is such a uh, tough thing to change. And even if it's very positive, because you have to get the sense of this is just how we do things around here has to change to a different concept of how we do things around here. So when you're thinking about this chart here, I'm going to walk through it a little bit, um, but this is a good chart to show um, even your leadership teams or whatever structure you have within your strategic planning. Um, and I want you to think about what are the things right now, if you were to step in the district you're currently in and any one of the different certification areas that people might be in. Um, what do you think is needed to have a successful change? So when you're looking at the, the first one, let's look at success right away. You have the vision that's clear. People have the skills that are needed to meet that vision. People are motivated to get there. You have the resources that support the motivation and the skills that are there. And your plan puts that all into place and it's all connected to your vision, you have success. Now, the other things that are laid to within your climate, and if you think about these concepts in the orange are really about climate, is that if you have a missing vision, but you have the skills, the incentives, the resources, and action plan, they might the action plan is going to be a little disjointed because it's not really sure where it's going. So there's going to be confusion. People are going to say, yeah, I have the skills to do a whole bunch of things. And I feel motivated to do them, but they're going in all these different directions and you're not really sure where the end point is. When you have vision, but are missing skills, people get very worried and they could be worried because it's like, I don't know how to do that. I'm not sure what to do even to be able to do that. And people also feel like their skills are lacking because you're talking about vision and you have all these things in place but people feel like they're lacking it, which means they're worried about their own safety. Am I going to lose my job? I don't have the skills to do that. And I don't know how to get there. And nobody's really helped me understand it. 
that now I'm worried that I'm not going to be a good employee. When incentives are missing, there actually can be some gradual change. There's vision, people have skills to do it, they have the resources that are supporting them, and the plan is, is clear. The problem is, is they're not motivated to do it. And again, it does not have to be financial. Maybe they don't understand the why behind it, and they're not connecting to the idea of, what could this mean for me if we attain these goals? How great would it feel if all students truly did make the growth we want? And really defining that so people understand that, that idea of what could happen in the long run. Now, when the resources are missing, there's frustration. So everything's in place. I have the skills. I have the ability to do it. But I don't have the books I need. But I don't have the professional development I need. But I don't have um, this piece of equipment that I need in order to do um, distance learning during a pandemic. There's a frustrational level there. And people end up kind of throwing their hands up in the air, which creates conflict. And you never really get to uh, the vision you're looking for. And then finally, the last one is where if you're missing an action plan, there's going to be a whole bunch of people trying different things and they're constantly going to find a wall. They're going to get to a certain point and be like, what's the next step? And then it stops. So there's going to be this constant like, I'm going to start and do this, stop, start and do this, stop. Um, so that's what the concept of false start is, is that there's never really a complete follow through. finally reached the end of this module. Uh, again, I appreciate your patience with the length of this one. A lot involved there.